Hello and welcome to Adipod, a podcast by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. I'm Emilio Garcia. Today, we talk about the pros and cons of foreign aid and China with our guest, David Mullen, a corporate lawyer who has done a lot of work internationally and nationally in law firms across Australia, the Middle East, and China. Enjoy the episode. Here we are at the ATA offices once again. I'm sitting here with Satya and Hello. Brian, who you know already, and our guest is David Mullen. Hello. Uh, David, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, probably uh, I'll give you the short version of who I am. I'm mm. a former academic from Macquarie University. Uh, I've now left that life to become a One Belt, One Road consultant. Okay. Uh, that essentially has come out of a former role as a partner of Western China's largest law firm. Mm -hmm. We take Chinese investors to the Middle East and Africa. Fantastic. Okay, so one of the things that we really wanted to talk to you about, because we think that you have a a unique perspective on this, is um, foreign aid. Yes. So foreign aid is not as simple as just taking money and giving it to poor people who need it and thus they get helped, right? Yes, so what are some of the more, what are some of, what are some of the nuances that you would say just going into it that you would want to add to people that want to learn a little bit more about foreign aid? Okay, definitely. If you don't mind, what I'd like to start with mm. um, is just kind of a contemplation that I'm trying to remember whether Friedman or Stigler had on kind of foreign aid and intervention in the market for the purpose of public good. And then I want to kind of get to the bottom of what is the issue with foreign aid. Uh, And if we look at the contemplation I was talking about, uh, let me talk for a moment about free trade coffee. Now, the thing with fair trade coffee um, is that everyone says, uh, I'm prepared to pay a little bit more so that someone has a living wage over in Kenya or Uganda or wherever they're growing the coffee. Now, this is a very nice thought. Um, we don't mind paying 50 cents extra for a cup of coffee. Uh, you go to Macquarie University, pretty much any university, you don't have a choice but to buy anything but fair trade coffee. Mm. And we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Yeah. And you go over to Africa and good stuff's happening, right? This guy now doesn't need to use his children on the farm. They're going to school. Mm. They're eating. Uh, everyone's getting educated. Everyone's very happy at the coffee farm. And the guy next door who grows bananas has seen this. He says, hey, why is your kid going to school? He says, well, ah. coffee's paying a lot of money. So now the banana guy says, well, at the end of this year, I'm burning down the banana crops and I'm planting some coffee crops. Uh, guy next to him doing coffee. Everyone's doing coffee. Now, every farm in Kenya is doing coffee. Okay. And everyone's making good money. Mm. Now, let's say a global financial crisis comes. Empirically, the first thing, the most elastic item of expenditure to be cut mm. is charity. Now, we're all happy to support the third world of nameless people on fair trade coffee, but if it's your choice whether you're going to pay the rent today or whether you're going to feel good about whether you're helping the Kenyan farmers, Mm. well, you pay the rent and you buy the 99 cent ground crap from Franklin's or Coles, and we're no longer buying the coffee. Gotcha. Now, you go back over to Kenya and have a look what happens as a result. Previously, one farmer would have absorbed a massive loss. But now there's a massive oversupply of coffee created by a massive oversupply generator, which was that increase in price. Mm. And everyone's got all this coffee. They can't get rid of it. They can't even sell it for what they sold it before the fair trade movement came in because now there's such an oversupply that they can barely give it away. And the worst of all of this is you can't eat coffee. So no one's got money and no one's got bananas and no one's got plantains and no one's got anything that they can eat. And so your goodwill by buying this cup of coffee is essentially genocide in a cup. Wow. (laughs) You've (laughs) done great damage. And And we come back to Adam Smith, who kind of says, well, I've never known anyone to do any good who purports to act in the public good. Mm. And we live in these systems that are so infinitely complex that we don't understand the consequences of our action. So the answer, according to kind of the great capitalist motivations, is we should just do what it is that's best for us. 
Now, yeah, kind in of, your own, yeah. kind of working in your own interest. Uh, Brian, did you want to jump in? Well, yeah, I mean, I get that. Like, I didn't really consider the fact that they're all moving into coffee. So I guess that means that as a flow on effect, once the price hits the floor and they can't do anything with it, mm-hmm. who else is out there with a diversified set of assets that they can then go, well, look, I've still got my banana farm going so I can shift over that. Like, they're all fucked. Mm. It's... Yeah. Jesus, okay. Now, uh, and if you look at what happened with the poppy fields in India, now that wasn't a kind of social capitalist intervention, but it was exactly the same situation, where you had someone with power directing a market, and we need to grow more poppy seeds. Mm. And now you have a country that still labours under a massive poppy seed plantation problem that they can't get rid of. Yeah, right. Um, and they need to feed themselves, you know, that we, can, yeah. we can't tell them not to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sorry if this hurts your sensibilities, I mean, but I want to feed my soul, kid. right? <laughs> <laughs> what I was left to do. Yeah, it feeds your soul, my kids. So I'm yeah. just going to keep growing it. Uh, but I want to take it one step further mm. because uh, you go, well, there's a whole field of charitable theory. And most people think of their foreign aid um, not in these terms. They think, okay, well, we go over and we build schools and we feed people and we make things happen. Um, But, I mean, if we think for a minute about how that would actually work, um, you would have everybody who is kind of on the side of foreign aid simultaneously screaming about how paternalistic this was, uh, about how it's an imposition upon a third world nation um, because we're directing how it is that they do their expenditure. So if we go for just a very small example, um, you have a group of people who want to help someone uh, in India, and they say, well, okay, we'll give them, so we'll give them some food. Mm. Okay, then you get welfare reliance, and everyone's familiar with that. Mm. So you say, instead, I'll educate their child. Child goes to school. Now, why isn't the kid going to school even when they're being paid? Well, the kid needs to work in the family business. So to get the kid to school, now we need to support the family business. So you're supporting the family business, kids going to school, then they say, well, why isn't this working? Well, now that the kids going to school, the family business is getting support, um, everybody else in the village has come for support, and now suddenly you need to start dealing with the whole village or else this particular family is going to be attacked for their (coughs) mental distribution of wealth. Uh, And that's simply not how the society is structured. Now you have to help the whole society. Right. Now, um, back on welfare dependence... So what you end up with, with the current charitable theory around this stuff, is what we need to do is give them the means of production to create their own enterprise. So I will give the guy a small motorised scooter, and he can now earn more money, Mm. and he's working for himself. Uh, But we don't want him to be irresponsible, right? So now we want him to repay the motorised scooter we gave him. Now you've just given the guy a loan on hopefully fairly favourable terms. So what does this look like in practice? Well, if we take it to the UN level, they will give um, a third world country or even a kind of developed region that's just not quite as developed as the UN Mm. would like them to be, say, here's a billion dollars for housing. Full stop. Use it correctly. Yeah, (laughs) no no one has kind of a housing project to do. And America's already been criticised so heavily about tying these aid funds to their people. So now there's a billion dollar housing fund sitting over in Africa somewhere. Um, in comes one bell, one road. Because mm. uh, no one can build housing cheaper than the Chinese can. And we say, well, we'll build houses for, let's say, $20,000. Yeah. And government will guarantee payment out of the housing fund at, let's say, $30,000. Who gets the $10,000? Well, you know, there's a quite unquote tender process involved in who gets these houses. That tender process generally has nothing to do with who's the lowest bidder on the houses. It tends to have who's giving the biggest cut to the person who's running the tender process or their family or their associates or everyone else because this is largely how the world works. So It would work possibly better if you didn't have a government that has no idea what they're doing and that is also deeply corrupt, which tends to be the case in these uh, to the people that you're giving money to, correct? I'd be hesitant to criticise them for not knowing what they were doing and for corruption. Um, In a sense, yes, they are corrupt, but the difference between the corruption of the third world and the first is not its magnitude. It's just the degree to which it's hidden. Mm. So I would much rather deal with third world corruption, which is almost equal opportunity. (laughs) Anyone can come to the third world and pay the right person the amount of money and it's there and it's open and everyone can engage in it. Now, you want to direct a politician in Australia and your organisation attempts to do this. And you have a very limited voice. 
Now, if you had a billion dollar slush fund in which you could donate to various campaigns and various political parties, and you could go to the right parties and pay for the right seats at the right fundraisers and mix with the right social set, then you would have a far greater degree of influence over the legislation of the state. Which is what we want, but the Cokes won't give us money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give, just, give them a call. It's exactly. just, just such a bummer. <laughs> they don't give money to, to organisations outside of Australia. <laughs> yeah. and America, and it's yeah. frustrating. Anyway, yeah. Register an American <laughs> subsidiary. Yeah. What I wanted to ask that you... That will help us with conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah, right. I wanted to ask you about one case which seems to be kind of like the perfect example yes. of, this, uh, of this structure failing, which yeah, is Haiti. Absolutely. Earth. Yes. Heidi, 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 Heidi. Yeah. Now, they, they basically have no economy, yes. per se. Everything that they have is provided by some kind of organization that is yeah. funded by foreign aid. And, you know, obviously no one can, can produce anything there because they can't sell it because all these international organizations are going to get to everyone for free. Yes. Uh, so, so how, I mean, there has to be some way in which we can say, okay, there was a terrible earthquake here. Yeah. We need to help them without them just creating a, a basically welfare state of a state. Yeah. Now, if I can offer, and this is where I'll kind of turn a little, I think, and mm. so far we've all been very much in agreement because I've only been establishing the groundwork for where I believe aid is necessary. Mm. And I think if we go back to the concept that these constructs are way <laughs> too complex for us to understand, and frankly, this is why intervention doesn't work from a low level to a very high level. And the more intervention you have, generally the worse things end up. Uh, but then what am I to do? Well, we live in a world that has these institutions that are founded on kind of empty, virtueless concepts. Mm. And they are freewheeling, they're operating. And if you try to insert virtue into them, then they just create chaos. So is the solution for every individual to simply give up on virtue? And say so that this is possibly the okay. worst outcome we could have. Yeah. And uh, as great as the genocide in a cup kind of example is, if I decide that my moral impetus is to sit at home and not give a damn about people starving in Africa, this really isn't a good outcome for anybody. <laughs> uh, so what I would argue you do is in any given situation as an individual, uh, whether you are in the halls of power or not, is to do what it is that is right in that given situation without regard for what those consequences may happen to be. Mm. Now, you may be inadvertently causing a genocide. Your other choice is to do nothing. And I think you're much better off to actually attempt to do good mm. and to follow the path of righteousness, which will eventually prevail if we continue to try. Okay. So what do we do in Haiti? Now... You know, as soon as you have a bureaucracy, it's corrupt. Mm. Um, the best thing to do would be to have the most direct action you could possibly do to, if you could get to Haiti and start giving people help, fantastic. It's not the position any of us are in. Mm. But if you can <clears throat> donate to kind of the best non-bureaucratic organisation that you can do within your limited research, then you've done a good thing. Uh, perhaps it doesn't have a good outcome, but you have done righteousness in your state. And as humans who are attempting to engage in some kind of virtue, engage in some kind of flourishing, I think that we have to make our choices where we stand rather than directing people. Yep. yep. So, like, uh, you know, to guess why they... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess uh, to play devil's advocate a little bit on this. So it seems to me that you're advocating for doing things out of good intention, even if those consequences can be perverse. Now, we know that some of the absolute worst things in human history have not happened at the behest of people who felt that they were just acting in their own self-interest. They've acted, uh, sorry, they've happened due to the actions of people who thought they were doing the right thing. And by in convincing themselves they were acting for the greater good, they can rationalize and justify things that are far worse than if they're purely acting on their own behalf. Um, so don't, so isn't it true that you should at least be mindful of the fact that the good that you do might be having these perverse consequences? Uh, now, where I would part ways with that, I think there is an objective good. Uh, and you can find this, and it's more or less equivalent. People a lot smarter than me have sat down over centuries and attempted to work out what the good is. Um, and it's an inviolable set of ethics, and you can find it in any religious text, more or less uh, what that good looks like. Uh, obviously, I have a preference for Christianity over any of the others, but... Um, you know, that's not the topic of this, but if you follow any of them and you assume that that is directing you towards the good, 
and you are honest in that pursuit. Now, when someone goes, oh, you know, I think I was doing good starting a communist revolution. I mean, fuck off, you picked up a gun and you started shooting people. Mm. Like, there is no conceivable way that you can think that picking up a gun and shooting someone is a good action. Right? Right. In your current present state. The difficulty is when we start, um, you know, sacrificing the good of the individual in their current status for a much grander construct. And you start creating bureaucracies and constructs beyond your own capacity to act and attempting to enforce your actions upon <laughs> others, that's when your problems start. So, I mean, I guess it's like you're talking about direct action versus like, you know, this, this higher being of action that has some of those short uh, downsides that you talk about. Um, but to your point before, one of the things we talk about, you know, with libertarianism is, you know, with great liberty comes personal responsibility and all those kinds of things. So, yes, you should be free to do things, but you shouldn't necessarily do them. Yeah. I think the flip side of that too is uh, if you think something should be fixed, well, fucking try and fix it. Mm. If you think someone should be helped, like if you walk down the street and you see a guy and you go, oh man, that guy should, you know, needs a bit of money, he's homeless, give him 20 cents. Mm. He's 20 cents closer to having more money, uh, like to having a, a meal or something like that. Right. You can be that person. I hate when I see people saying, oh, this scenario sucks. Someone needs to do something yeah. about it. Yeah, you're that someone. That's a very good example, though, because as a person who gives, let's say, I'm contributing to this person's mm. welfare, I believe, by giving them 20 cents. Someone on the other side of that may say, you're contributing that 20 cents may seem virtuous in the moment that you hand it over. That homeless person, though, may actually take that and then use it for drugs and might kill him. Sure, and so but, but I'm not... But, I think that this is where the moral dilemma comes in, in which, sure, fair trade coffee or but, even even more nefarious examples where we're contributing to these organizations that are controlling the economy of the country yeah, completely. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, how, how do you draw this distinction? Well, to, 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 yeah. uh, I mean, with that, I mean, I had this sort of thought recently where I was approached by a guy in Perth when I was in Perth. Mm. And he asked me for 10, 20 bucks for food. 20 bucks? And, and his eyes were sort of buzzing around rapidly. And, you know, he looked like someone was probably a junkie. And I was thinking to myself, this guy's probably going to spend that, you know, possibly going to spend that money on drugs. But he's asking for it for food. And I was like, should I give him the money knowing that he could do that? And then I realized, you know what? If I do give him the money, and hypothetically, let's say he spends it on drugs, mm. at the least, the, the sin there, or the, or the vice, is on his part. Exactly. He's the one who decided to spend the money that way. I've done the right thing on my part. Whereas if I don't give him the money, then okay, yeah, he might not end up spending it on drugs or he might not end up having a meal. Well, you can just give him the food though. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the, sure, that's the issue. Sure, but you have the food on? I don't, I don't want us to get too method. caught up in kind of the detail of individual yeah. scenarios, but I think, you know, we're talking about examples here that I agree with all of them. It's yeah. someone is taking action to do what it is that they think within their individual liberty. Yes. And to me, the great example is Danny Melbourne, which is... A place that I'm equally fond of and hate. Um, <laughs> there's like the part that I hate is I'm like walking down the street and the third day in the row there must have been a thousand people raising awareness for climate change. Oh, now, right, we're, we're aware of it. Um, people have different views, but no one is unaware that this is a hot button issue. And they're standing there with all of these placards, and I approached one of them and I just said, "Look, how about you guys have been here? Everyone knows your point of view, and they're arguing and." You're going to spend, what, three hours here today protesting? What if every one of you went and planted a tree today? <laughs> right? Whether you agree that man-made climate change or not, everyone agrees more trees are a good thing. Yeah. Go and take action. Now, yeah, maybe we lead to forest fires, maybe we lead to something else, but you, know, you have done what is necessary in your power to do something. Yeah, I mean, this is an excellent point. So a couple of weeks ago, I was walking through Martin Place and there were some protesters with Stop a Dying Signs. And this is after the federal election and uh, after a point where they said, actually, look, Adani's going ahead. So a little bit too late. But anyway, I thought I'll, I'll just ask them some questions and I'll approach them as idiot man and just ask <laughs> some really basic questions. I go, hey, so what's going on here? Oh, we're protesting the Adani mine. Okay, but I, I thought it was happening. I thought it's going ahead. Well, we're trying to put a stop to it. Where's Adani? Central Queensland. We're in Martin Place. And you're drawing murals in chalk mm. what policy change are you affecting with this so i think it's like there's effective uh you know there's, yeah. there's effective charity there's effective activism right you know there's effective ways to go about changing the structures that you think are mm. uh, unjust yeah uh and 
there's a lot of lazy activism out there. Well, there was this woman who grew her leg hair for a month to fight against oppression of women in the Middle East. Remember when we stopped Kony? Thank you. (laughs) I think, think, you know, if we put it back in religious terms and then to take Mm -hmm. it back to kind of Africa, what we have is a situation of original sin, where we have a world that is so mired in complexity of wrongdoing and we've built institutions in the absence of righteousness that ultimately we're going to get bad outcomes and there will always be corruption involved in these things. Now, is the solution to sin to park yourself on a bench and throw your hands up and say, oh, there's nothing I can do about it? Probably. Absolutely not. Um, you should find for yourself, and you don't need to find God to do this, you need to find an inviolable set of ethics that makes sense and you need to follow them. And now, to me, um, if you're going to have an Australia, and I'm not a fan of nation states, but if you are to have an Australia and it's to mean anything and we're to have a collective conscience, then us giving money to house Africans in mm. whatever way, shape or form is a noble thing. Mm. Um, now, it's a much more complex thing because are we taking money out of Australian children's mouths to do so and can we afford to do so? Mm. Um, arguably, I think yes. Um, what does that mechanism look like behind the scenes? There's a bunch of quite wicked people making quite profitable outcomes out of this, myself included. But, um, you know, the other option is we just give up on righteousness. Mm. We go, well, there's too much sin here. There's no virtue. Um, Okay, so uh, I think this is a good place to wrap up that subject. And we want to move into another subject that you seem to be uh, great to talk to about. China. 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 So China. Yep. Uh, China is uh, both apparently very good because we love all of the products that they sell us, and it's fantastic because and the money they invest and the mo- all that yep. stuff, and also <laughs> we're terrified of them because they want to spy on us, and uh, they also want to uh, take all our baby formula. Yep. Now you have some <laughs> <laughs> unique perspectives on this, so uh, why, why, why don't you guide us through that? Okay, uh, I mean the relationship with China is probably slightly complex in that. Um, as a broad spectrum, um, what do I di- identify myself as? I say I'm a Christian, but that's probably an insufficient reference point for people who do not know me and can't spend hours understanding what I mean by that. Mm. Uh, Christian anarchist is probably closer to kind of a summary that would get people where they need to get to. So I'm no fan of giant state, app- state apparatus. China is obviously a huge state apparatus. <laughs> um, but then I also realised that I'm living within a real world. And as I said, I'm a big fan of individual action. What can you do to actually make a positive impact on the world? Now, mm. me standing around and going, there shouldn't be a China. You know, the people of China should determine their own fate through anarchist Christian value. Uh, I'm not going to live to see that, no matter how ridiculous things get with the world. And they're getting ridiculous fairly quickly. Um, But so, you know, in its present state, to evaluate China as a nation state in the state of the world as it presently stands, uh, the fear is absolute nonsense. And basic fact-checking is not happening. Um, You get, you know, the one that always strikes me, everyone says, China controls the majority of American sovereign debt. Absolute nonsense. The largest holder of US sovereign debt is Japan. Um, now, if you added together... Well, America is. Yeah, well, America, <laughs> sorry. Then, okay, then foreign Japan holder China. would be yeah. Japan. Then yeah. we probably have to go to... If you put together the Gulf region mm. collectively, you would probably have Saudi Arabia individually and the Gulf region collectively mm. um, coming well before China does. And then you would have China. Um, but ultimately, if the US were really concerned about this, it could buy back its own debt through its institutions in Hong Kong, because that debt is for sale in China, and they could pay it off with the US dollar and create a huge inflationary pressure and buy it back for half the amount that it's worth. Uh, this kind of debt nonsense is, you know, pure fear monger. It's like, look at the size and the power of China. Mm. Now, I think... One of the problems is China is uh, historically uh, kind of have this uh, philosophy that they should hide their light. And I think it's quite brilliant that they would not show people the power that they had until the time came that they could not hide it no longer. And I think they've kind of got to the point where we can hide it no longer. And then they've said, look at all we've achieved. And then people have gone, they're the new superpower. And China's gone, yeah, yeah, right. We're the new superpower. Uh, And there's some credibility to that. Mm. Uh, The problem is, if you look at China as the new superpower, China as the competitor to US, 
a very unfair foundation. 30 years ago, China was poorer than every country in Africa mm. on a GDP per capita basis. Right. Now, if you look at the progress China has made over 30 years, um, it is the most progressive, amazing, fantastic, wonderful leadership structure in the world. Um, you've never seen such a period of growth with yeah. such a large population without civil or international strife. Uh, and what form does this kind of take in the West? Mm. Um, you're still not good enough. And uh, then there's kind of the, you're not doing good enough. And then there's the, we're terrified of you coming and stealing everything from us. And I actually think the baby formula is a perfect example mm. if we talk about that. Uh, everyone is so concerned. And there's like a headline a couple of days ago, like, you know, this woman confronts a formula hoarder. Now, it could just be my unique experience. I have a three-year-old daughter at home and we bought formula for her. I think once in mm. the entire time we were formula feeding, did mm. I go to a shop and not be able to buy formula? Uh, you know, why are they buying the formula? You hear the common story. Well, you know, they're selling formula in China. It was fake. There was plastic in it. Babies got sick. And so the Chinese want to buy formula. Now, first of all, can you blame them? Right? If I'm concerned that Australian formula has plastic in it, I'll yeah. buy what kind of formula I can. Um, but second of all, is this really a profitable venture? Absolutely not. You buy formula for 20 bucks. There's probably 10 to $12 in shipping. Um, then you're going to have to engage in packaging, wrapping, the mm. time it takes to buy these things. You're buying two in every store. Uh, you go, you drive down to your local Woolworths, you buy two formulas, you bring them back, you wrap them up, you send them off, you're going to make like five bucks. Mm. This is not a profitable outcome for people. And on a huge really scale, sense. you know, the ASX listed Daigo companies can make a bit of money. Mm. But the average person buying the formula is not. Right. So why is it that they do this? Well, this is actually about money coming into Australia, not formula going out. Ah. Uh, so China has a law that you can't move more than $10,000 US per year outside of China gotcha. without state approval. Yep. So this is like every country with an outbound currency law. The easiest way for people to move money is if someone has money in Australia and China, they give them a bit of money in China and the guy gives them a bit of money in Australia. And there's no international transfer of money. Mm. And no laws are being broken. And it's a bit of a grey area because, you know, you know what's going on here. Yeah. But you get a guy who's quite rich. He goes, okay, good opportunity. I'll create a big stack of money in Australia with an empty account in China. And slowly, 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 the Chinese account fills right up. And the Australian account goes down to zero. Mm. How does he rebalance that? Well, if he's sending over $50 million worth of milk powder on a ship... He can provide his own FX services. Gotcha. And now he can make 3 to 4% on the exchange of money. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. I, I like the context that you're adding, but I don't want it to seem, and I don't know, I don't think this is the point you're making, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, that China is in somewhat, uh, to, to coin a term from the left-wing uh, spectrum, problematic. I mean, China definitely does not have the interests that a lot of other countries have. China definitely is doing some incredibly nefarious things within its own borders. Business alone, what it has done to American businesses, what it has done to European businesses that, that, have, that attempt to enter China is ridiculous, uh, not to mention what they're doing to their population. So, I mean, to say that maybe the fear-mongering is going too far, sure. But are we really to say that China is something that we shouldn't worry about? Absolutely. I would actually say I don't think we need to worry about them to the degree we do. Not to the degree, but they're, no. not, they're not someone that we should, should just cast aside and it's a silly little... Uh, I mean, we shouldn't cast aside New Zealand as a silly little place either. Um, well, they're not a threat to us. It, it would be silly to say that New Zealand is a threat to Australia or, or the United States. Okay, well, let's take um, Indonesia or our friends, right? Mm. Um, it would be silly to say that Indonesia is never going to be a threat and to completely abandon the concept of keeping an eye on the fact we have good relations with mm. them. Um, I'd put China in the same basket, right? Uh, they're much bigger than Indonesia is. And they're much more powerful. They have a lot more money than Indonesia is, um, although not by the magnitudes that people think that they do. Um, you have Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Vietnam and Thailand together, and the Southeast Asian bloc has almost as many people and way more economic power. Mm. Um, but we ignore them because they're quote-unquote our friends. Now, why isn't China our friend? Because the US doesn't like them? Uh, what, because we think they're buying our baby formula? I'm not quite sure why it is that China is 
Oh, yeah. there was a Clive Palmer video that said that they had an airport, so there, there you go. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've got the airport. Um, and, and this is this is <laughs> where we get, uh, I think, mostly ridiculous because you have Australia is just completely disingenuous in its dealings with China. Mm. We're trying to have our cake and eat it too. Let's face it, we can't piss off America and they're like big brother and they're giving us the military protection. They're huge militarily. Like, let's not deceive ourselves. Mm. If China and, and America went to war. The US would obliterate them in about six minutes flat. The US has more military force than the rest of the world combined. Mm. Um, they're the ones to fear. But China, uh, you know, Australia wants their money. And they're quite happy to take their money. Mm. And they're happy to take it for ports and airports. And then turn around and play wide-eyed, shocked. Oh, how on earth did China end up with our port? How did we end up with an airport? One of the questions I have around some of that fear around, oh, well, they've got a port in Darwin or something like that. And that means that they'll be able to just set up a base. Okay. So let, let's just... No, no, yeah, no. But, that, but that's no, what I see. Yeah, I see, yeah, I see yeah. people go down that path. So, all right, let's just workshop that out. China, you know, gives a dodgy loan to a third world country and goes, hey, we'll help you build this power plant. Yeah. Right? Oh, they do that here. They go, hey, you know what? We're going to put an airbase here and it'll help you for your coal mines and this, that, and the other. Mm. Okay, thanks. And then all of a sudden they decide they don't like us and want to invade us. And they go, oh, we made that airbase for you. You've got to give it back. Like, it, 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 how does that work? Yeah. At what point do we go, oh, well, no, actually, fuck the, organ like, fuck the agreement we had. You're mm. now an enemy combatant. This isn't happening. I, like, yeah, it's... Well, can, can I just draw a perfect yeah. example back to Africa and aid, mm. in fact? Um, and, you know, it gives the justification of why China is so successful under mm. One Belt, One Road, and also why we don't need to fear them as much as we think on exactly that point. Mm. Um, for example, you know, Tanzania wants to get a big loan, and the UN says, we'll give you a loan, provided that you decriminalise homosexuality. Right. And the ruler of Tanzania is there going, we don't really have a huge problem with homosexuality here. Like, we're still stamping out witchcraft in our corners. <laughs> if I do this, I've lost power. Like, that's just unnecessary for me. China comes with the same loan and says, oh, we'll build the thing. What do you want in return? We want some damn money. Right? It's on profitable terms for China. Yeah. And if you can't pay, we'll repossess. And Tanzania says, great. And not in Tanzania itself, and in a very similar situation, I sat down with one of these politicians and I said, you know, doing my moral duty, you know that this is a predatory loan. Yes. I said, so you know they'll repossess it. Yeah, they need David. They're not an idiot. <laughs> you know, he gave me the history of Africa. We have been fucked by the English. We have been fucked by the Americans. I think we're going to get fucked by the Chinese. They come in here. They build our power plant. And they want it back. Well, nationalise it. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not the UN. Yeah, they can't trade sanction us. Mm. And if they do, we've lost some cheap imports. Right. Uh, like, you know, we're, we're a net importer from China in most of these situations. So, yes, um, they're building infrastructure for us on commercial terms. And they are commercial terms. And, and that's in a third world country. So yeah. what are they going to do with a port oh. in Western Australia? Yeah. They'll yeah. go, oh, you know what? You're going to give us that money back. And if it really came to, from push to shove, like, you know, push came to shove, I think we just go, nah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, well, I think I think uh, I think a subject would be basically yeah maybe they don't have the best of intentions but they're not really that scary anyway. Yeah, well, more they to the point, really like Rush Tech Huawei, um, mm. and this is everyone's concern. Like China's getting all yeah. that information. Mm. Um, I mean, right. first of all, everyone's got all our information everywhere anyway. Yeah. Uh, we'd be idiots to assume otherwise. But let's say China gets all our information, and China must have the largest database of crap <laughs> in the world because the amount of stuff it collects. Mm. Then you go well. You know, why does this concern us? Um, well, perhaps the solution to people having information is just for us to stop being dicks for a minute. <laughs> right? If we were approaching things on a fair and sensible and justifiable and equal footing and we weren't um, imbued with you know, hostile intention, then who cares what we have to say? Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of going right back to our first point, I guess, if we acted nobly and with integrity, then we have nothing to fear from those that shine the light on us. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Well, um, I know we, we could go on for, for hours talking about uh, China and foreign aid and everything, but we have run out of time, so thank you so much for being with no, us. Thank this you was so fascinating, much for and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Adipod, 
a podcast by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. If you care to know more about the ATA, visit their website, www.taxpayers.org, where you'll be able to see their mission statement, their projects, campaigns, objectives, and so much more. Remember, listening to the podcast is free, but creating it isn't. If you'd like to continue to see the Australian Taxpayers Alliance advocacy, please consider becoming a member or donating. You can do this on their website as well. This has been Adipod. We'll see you next time.